she also had early inspiration in that her father was an architect, and so she was always seeing people drawing at home and um, seeing drawings around. So um, that family familiarity as well. Um, she was also influenced by several 19th century painters, Thomas Dewing, William M. Chase, Edmund Tarbell, I don't know that guy, and Antonio Mancini, and Mary Cassidy. Um, Linda especially alludes to, well, we're going to talk a little bit about this, the Gilded Age, an epoch in American history after the Civil War. That, for some, is symbolic of a time of prosperity for the arts, an act of culture of art patronage and the early beginnings of feminism. Um, now, switching to John, John studied art and photography at Austin College in Sherman, Texas. He worked in television, film, and interactive media production in Chicago and Austin, and he's a music producer. So lots of ambitious irons in the fire, and apparently now he's an author as well. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> a book author. I see yeah. that you did lots of articles and reviews yeah. Yeah. Um, throughout your career. Um, so both of them have these very strong competencies in, in the, their fields of expertise. Um, and now they're working on projects together. So, um, Linda, I wanted to start with you a little bit um, and just ask you to break down a term that I've heard. So we've been representing you at Radius for about over a year, right? Yeah, around a year. Um, and which means I talk about her work to people, to people who have never seen it before. Um, you know, there's not a week goes by that I'm not having a conversation about her work. And um, um, so I see what people are gravitating to and what they're intrigued by. And I want to flesh this out of, of you all too. Um, but one of the things that I remember hearing about you and then I pass along regularly and then I realized I didn't know exactly what it meant was that you are classically trained and that is a different and I, I guess my confusion is whether or not that's like I know it's not a degree is it an approach a methodology why do some people use that phrase and others no, don't I don't really know but I think um, to me it means a more formal mm -hmm. um, approach to learning um, Drawing is very important to yeah. me. Um, and my dad is a classical artist. He's classical. So it was my influence always. Um, I just think it, it's, it's, there's a certain formality with, with the classical. So coming from a, a, a literature background, classical is sort of reserved for the kind of rule-based area, often of the 18th century, where everything right. had, had strong principles of measurements. And right, and that has also been okay. very, yeah, very important to me. Lots of, lots of measuring from line. Um, <laughs> yeah, all that. Yeah, I think it's important for me. I'm the kind of person that needs a firm start. Mm-hmm. And so having that sort of um, knowledge of anatomy and how to draw um, was important. Yeah. yeah. And that new school that just opened up in Missoula, the fine art studio that yeah. um, Tara Chapman and um, Mal, that married couple, do you know them? They started, it's across from the clay studio. And they are also, I, I guess I wanted to bring up this term because that's the term they're using too. Is right. This is a type of classical training right. that they got in Italy when they were... Um, and I studied uh, with a man in Santa Fe who also taught at the Florence Academy. So mm -hmm. it's a very familiar approach to me. I'm actually working with them and they're great. Yeah. Yeah, I really like, I really like working with them. They're helping me with all sorts of different things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And drawing, drawing once a week, um, and then doing loose sketches once a week, and then a long pose, a six-week uh, figure pose, which ends up to be about 18 hours of one pose. Mm. Yeah. And so then you really can get a complete <laughs> drawing, and um, I guess that's what I mean by classical. It's just, it's a more formal approach. It's a careful approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Florence Academy has a very specific approach to painting. So that sounds like it's very... Um representational and accuracy based. Very much so. Okay. But I mean, 
when you look at your paintings, there's also so much that is evocative that's coming out right. of them. So what's the balance in there between this this classical measurement and this mood and its expression that's right. coming out? I think it's like I said, I need a, I'm the kind of person that needs a, um, a firm foundation. Mm-hmm. So I like to have that firm foundation, then I like to kind of do what I want. So that's, that's sort of... That's sort of the way I approach it. And the further I go, the more I, the more, the more I want um, a, a more formal approach to painting and drawing. Well, I mean, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, you know, I think a lot of people go the other way. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. But the the further I go, and the more I learn, and the more I can do technically, the more I want to do technically. Hmm. So, yeah, it's kind of a draw. That is true, because... because yeah, it's kind of a draw, right? <laughs> it's very seductive to, to, to be able to take it a little further. It being accuracy? Yeah, for me. Yeah? Yeah, and then mess it up a little bit. I mean, I like to be able to take it as far as I want and then mess it up, which is where the encaustic comes in. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I do hear from artists who started out doing very accurate drawings. Right. More often, you're right, they do want to go looser and Other looser way. as they get more accomplished. Yeah, I want to go not tighter and tighter. But I want I want <laughs> I want to be able to. Yeah. I want to be able to. Is there is there a technical challenge? No. Oh, I think I'll lose. Okay. Well, this is getting fascinating. Uh, now, is this because I read in, in your book here that you thought that you were a bad student with oh, no natural worst. ability when you That's started? True. That's absolutely true. Are those two connected? Um, I don't understand your question. Well, you want to go toward greater accuracy. Oh. And that's what's the most challenging to you, um, is that rooted in the fact that you... It's not the most challenging anymore. Uh-huh. Um, but I just think I'm, I was the worst student. I was just at the bottom of the class. When Qualitatively. <laughs> Qualitatively. <laughs> I, my first painting class, the, the, we all put our paintings up, and I had chosen this huge, long canvas that there was no way in hell I was going to be able to do it. Mm-hmm. And so the teacher said, I think we should all give Linda credit for trying. <laughs> That's how bad You got the try trophy. <laughs> I got the try trophy. <laughs> That's the worst trophy ever. Oh, well, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. But I was determined. Yes. I was determined. And and I like that that you just decided that you were going to, that this is what you were going to do. That's yeah, what. I wanted to do one thing well. One, in my life, I wanted to do one thing well. And so, I, and also the other funny thing about failing is that it makes you not afraid because you've already screwed up, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think that um, in your quest for more technical capability, then when you go to paint or express something, and you have the confidence right. to do whatever you want. Right? right, and that's what I meant, that I need a firm foundation, and then I can go do what I want. Mm-hmm. But I can't just bluff. Mm-hmm. You know, I need the... You're getting an aha uh-huh from another painter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's hard to bluff, isn't it? Yeah, I, th- I think another way to say it is that um, you, you don't want to sort of um, riff on something by default because you don't know how to do it otherwise. You want to be able to choose. Exactly. Choose to do it. Like, you, you can do it formally and then riff. Right. But not by default riff because right. you don't know what else to do. Right. Yeah. That's, that's right. really good. Yeah. So it's this, it's about agency. In your craft. Yes. Yeah, having full. Right. Hmm. Very interesting. I think the book is, uh, you know, having known your work for a year, I, I mean, I thought I understood it, um, but the book is really fascinating on the journey that you mm-hmm. that you went on. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it all, but um, 
up front are images, paintings that she did in the 80s, and it's really apparent how her style has changed. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, they're beautiful, but I wouldn't guess these are Linda Leslie paintings. Mm -hmm. um, they seem like Linda Leslie paintings to you. Though, no, they? it's just interesting. <laughs> yeah, and when I realized I was looking at older paintings, I got very excited. And there's a nice, beautiful index. Thank you for this in the back that has all the dates. So you can see thumbnails of all the pictures you were looking at and see mm -hmm. how the dates, I mean, as um, just studying the arc of someone's um, career, it, this is a super fascinating tool. Then his grandson looked at the index and he said, we painted all of those. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so you get to study the details up here, but then you really get to see how the palette changes, how it moves in and out of color schemes. It's just, it's really mm -hmm. smart. Um, and a, a way of studying. I can get that. Thank you. Um, so it shows us many fascinating things that I think that you can't see in a gallery. I mean, we've done two or three shows where we're showing bodies of work of where she is in, you know, 2017, 2018. But this gives you like this other image of, of what you've been through. And you really see the, um, the thematic things. Like I think this page, um, genre devices in Linda's work is also just a really fascinating from a book, like putting a book together. Um, like she, the repetition of teapots and these domestic kind of and letters and books and how and so when you start about thinking about recurring images and recurring themes like just to have that evidence there like this is meaningful to her mm -hmm. you know we get to know you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and it totally reminded me of mary cassett's um mm -hmm. yes how do you say your name? Cassatt. Cassatt. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry. I read more than I speak. <laughs> so I have this problem. Yeah, you do it so well. <laughs> yeah. Um, because she had so many little teapots. Right. And, and it's, yeah, it's the um, comfort of life. You know, it's yeah. um, books. I mean, books are important to me. I've always been a big reader. And I love books. And I love to decorate my house with books. Me too. I love leather books, <laughs> leather journals. Mm. Yeah. I hate that new design idea now where people are turning books' spines in just to give it a more neutral look. What? Mm -hmm. No. It's a, it's a look. I don't approve it, and if I ever catch any of you doing it, I won't visit your homes anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, John, you put this together, and it represents 40 years of Linda's life before you knew her. Um, what did you learn about her? Ah. First thing, um, I was familiar with some of her work since about 2004, mm -hmm. uh, because I either photographed it or put it on a website. But um, find, tracking down the older paintings was really useful as part of a sort of storyboarding what the story we were going to tell was going to be about and seeing um, some of the paintings from when she was not the best student and uh, how she, not, she, <laughs> she grew out of that um, and grew into some of the things that I had seen early on when I first met her. And um, I was really fortunate in that I got to see uh, pretty much everything she did for mm -hmm. uh, almost uh, you know, 12, 14 years and already had sort of a, a story in mind about that part of it. Mm -hmm. But going back and doing the research on the older paintings helped inform how some of those things came about and why they were important. What was important about the, the things that she was doing contemporarily? So what did you learn? Any, any Well, I, I tried to express that in, <laughs> in the book, uh, that there are certain thematic elements mm -hmm. that uh, um, Linda has a love of beauty, and particularly women. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, 
the context that she puts her figures is very important to her. The, the stillness, the, the peace, the um, thoughtfulness. A lot like some of the um, some of the painters in the late 1800s that were instead of mythic scenes or allegorical scenes, they were starting to paint scenes of just domestic life and honoring that. And um, I think that's always been a, an important part of Linda's work after she sort of developed what she wanted to do. She get, mm-hmm. got the skill and the, and the uh, uh, competency to paint whatever she wanted, and then that's what she chose to paint. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about these paintings. Um, let me ask you all out there, what, what's some of the language to describe the mood of the piece? No, you guys don't get to talk right now. What is some of the language that you... Well, I, I, I like the, uh, this one. I like the paintings inside the painting. I think that that's really... It adds a, uh, a domestic feel to it. Um, and, of course, the dog. You <laughs> four paintings in one. I know. And the dog, too. And one of the fascinating things is that the... The paintings are often paintings I was that she's that. done. Mm-hmm. Are these well, paintings just... that you've done as well? There's a picture. Um, I like that. Um, there's a there's a lot of There's one painting that this is actually on the wall, <laughs> or a painting oh, very much like this is in one of those interior settings, and you're mm-hmm. like, hey, I know that painting. I've seen that painting before. Okay. So. That's kind of a, a an insider thing too. It feels like. So, what's some other language that you would use to describe? I think they're all pretty very pensive. Like, there's a lot of emotion that you can feel coming from behind each of the characters that are in the paintings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also a real quietness and stillness mm-hmm. that I think is mm-hmm. real lovely. Maybe? Mm-mm. Okay. Mm-mm. <laughs> Jim? I, the word quietness is what I would agree with. Yeah. yeah. How about, so with quietness, is there tension in there as well? Yes, for me, with that shadow on the lower right, or left hand, or right hand from the picture's perspective. Yeah. The one that the shadow doesn't uh, clearly accommodate, you know, the rules that you talk about, mm-hmm. blends out a bit, <laughs> and so that that creates a kind of tension and it's quiet. Yeah. What are some other just adjectives that you would use to describe them? I wanna not play. <laughs> Go ahead. So those are my two younger daughters that they were raised in the era where girls weren't allowed to be wild little animals. <laughs> <laughs> and they had to sit still all the time. It was, that would be my daughters. But, because they love literature and, and they love that era of literature uh-huh. and that's portrayed there. So if they had to behave what are you seeing there? Yeah, it's just that they, they love Jane Austen books. They love all that period through that later on where their girls would have to be very proper. They would look at them and they would be using their imaginations as to be even more boisterous. Yeah. The muted, the muted tones are very calm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anything else about those? muted tones that, that you I would were... like to follow up and ask if you were conscious of that flattening of that shadow on from my point of view the left side of the my, my uh, the, that side there. Oh did I do that on purpose? Or or felt that it meant something and left it alone because it the more I look at it it's very dramatic. I mean if I block it out with my finger the whole picture takes on a very, very dramatic, third-dimensional dimensionality. And when I take it away, it 
it it changes the picture. It doesn't mm -hmm. change those other things, but it changes the overall mood of the picture. I think I, I just like the idea of um, sort of the vignetting, mm -hmm. and, and that's probably that's I'm sure why I did that. Mm -hmm. But also, I think your sensitivity to tension. Um, and well, that, I would like to think that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's consistent true. enough that we can okay. say that you yeah. have a sensitivity to it. <laughs> um, because it's in all of them. That's, I mean, yeah. 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 These, I, I mean, when people come into the gallery, they're very much like, what's the story here? What's going on? Because there's something narrative about them. There is tension that says right. there's something happening here. Yeah. Um, and I, um, what you said about your daughters, I feel like a lot of people, when they see these paintings, start doing that sort of projecting to people they know and ideas that they know. I mean, that's sort of the invitation that these, that these paintings give you. That's one of the things that I think distinguishes Linda's actual paintings from the more academic work, which mm -hmm. is very photoreal. It just sort of is what it is, is that there is this room for the viewer to bring their story or some story they know mm -hmm. in to fill in the gaps that she's left in the painting. Yeah. Um, so let's look at the horse one over there. Um, so in this one, you can almost see, well, it's two women and a dog. There's, you know, we're in a, a domestic interior. There's signs of domesticity but there's not signs of work i like that it's just like this tiny little table like you're not getting any work done on that <laughs> i mean there's almost like a build-in like no work is being done this is a a den of idleness going on. <laughs> but yet there is um you know when i when they asked me to write something uh, uh, about it it was like there's so many of these paintings that there's something about to happen right outside the frame like are you waiting for a story from or something news from the doctor news from the war front you know you know where where are the actors um because these people are waiting for the actors right yeah and that and i think that's where the the feminism comes out in this is like what are the roles of women in this I think time period true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Because they look quiet. But yeah. There's something yeah. going on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean right. two minutes later they yeah. Yeah. look quiet, right? Yeah. Or, right? Or earlier. Right. Or earlier. Right. <laughs> and then with the the image the paintings there, especially around her head, there's so much someone used the word about imagination. Like this is clearly a space of imagination because the doing is happening in the interior. Right. Is that what you, am I reading this right or am I it's really interesting. going too far? I, I hear this kind of interpretation really of it in the gallery. But what is interesting to me, if you go over to the animals, is that the animals kind of have that going on too. <laughs> there's no rider. <laughs> yeah. You know, and there's no pack in it. Uh -huh. just there. The animals have it going on. I like that. <laughs> So there's this consistency um, of creating tension through composition and posing the, the figures. Um, just really interesting. I think that's part of the, one of the words that I was expecting to hear, because I hear it a lot in the gallery, is mysterious. Like there's so much mystery in these. And I love that the horses create that sense of mystery yes, thank you. as well. I, I mean, it's not... Um, I don't know. It's, it's, I think that that's part of what's interesting about your work. Um, so you have these um, recurring themes. Um, what what do you think is the pool of these? Um, mm. Why do you keep coming back to them? I guess because they're comforting, and no. because I know them. I, I I feel myself needing them a little bit lately. Mm. So I, I think that I'll, I'll be bringing in some different <coughs> talents um, that maybe even have a little more mystery to them. More mystery? More mm. mystery. 
But you have gone through some different, like I love that you have a whole circus Picasso kind of right. harlequin phase. Well, where did that come from? Did you I love know. Picasso? I love Picasso. And uh, it's just, it was just fun to do it. Mm-hmm. Just fun to play with it. Let's see if I can show some pictures. A friend of mine said that Picasso, with the, a successful piece of art, goes directly into your subconscious. It doesn't stop. And I think that's what Picasso could do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See? Mm-hmm. Some of these harlequin ones are often fun. An animal interaction between an animal and a woman. Mm-hmm. My father, when he saw that, Thing with the horse, he said, I don't get the horses. Mm-hmm. The horses, and then there are these pairs from strings. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. I like it though. That doesn't happen in your house. <laughs> Bobbing for pairs with horses? No. Um, interesting. Um, so, what was I, where was I going with this? Um, and why do you think you're drawn to that era? I don't know. I just always have been. And, it, yeah, and I just sort of can't get away from it. Yeah. And I don't really want to get away from it. Um, I think it's, I don't know if it serves me well, but it's all I can do, really, and feel true to myself. Mm-hmm. I remember of mine said, could you please just stop putting everybody in a long skirt? And no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. Do you, do you feel like that there's some connection in what you like to read? Or why is it probably, that you're coming back probably to Probably what I like to read, the way I like to dress. Um, there's a certain formality to it that I like. Hmm. Um, there's there's discipline. There's all the things that are kind of important to me. But what about the um, ideas of the Victorian age? Are you <laughs> sort of fascinated by those, or is it just the? It's more the aesthetics of the Victorian age. Mm-hmm. Yeah, huh. it's the look. Yeah, mm-hmm. Zula has that look. Look mm-hmm. in the architecture. In the architecture. And you know, the, just to be able to play with the the clothes and the jewelry and the hair. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions for follow up questions for them? I'm going to ask John if you not, but I don't want to move on too quickly. There you go. Um, so, what is, what is your feeling about calling these romantic? Like, is it the, what this, the definition yeah. of romantic? Yeah, I don't know. I have a love-hate relationship when I say that. Um, because they are, I think. But, I, you know, I don't, I, I don't want to um, get corny about it, right? Um, so, as I say, I kind of have a love-hate relationship. But, but it's, it's sort of in, it's in my nature. You know, and I think it was a romantic era, and it was very much about beauty, and um, so I guess that's why I call them romantic. And and as I say, I, I don't necessarily like that, but I can't get away from it. Mm-hmm. So you're more drawn to the idealism of the romantic. I think sense. that's true. Yes, that's a good way to put it. And and when you say romantic here, you're not talking about lovey-dovey romance. You're talking about the romantic era, like, right. the roman- like the romantic poets. Right. So, and the romance of the dress and the, you know, the romance of the whole thing. Yeah. Um, uh, so one of the word. No, no, it is, <laughs> but it, that that's a word that's, no, that has like three yeah. meanings, because yeah. romantic can mean of Roman. Um, romantic <laughs> can mean um, the, the pushback against the 18th century, which was a uh, very um well we talked about that formality right um and you know the the metaphor for the 18th century was the clock everything had to be very calculated um the 19th century 
referred to the 18th century as the perversion of reason. So it's what happens when reason goes too far and you want to insert some imagination to it. So the romantic poets, the romantic um, um, painters, they became called romantic because they were, um, it was a, it was the romance of the mind rather than the physicality of the 18th century. So that's, that's where that term romantic, wow, I never knew that. which is, that was really which is the, what you're, to me, that's what you're, you're, it's derivative of the 19th century. It, um, puts up, um, the imagination over reason. Like if you have to prioritize those things, imagination goes slightly above huh. 18th century. Um, it's reason over imagination and then contemporary. It's all just mixed up together. <laughs> in, in Germany, it was um, the Romantics were trying to I think they were trying to create a national sort of feeling like what is truly German, weren't they? I mean, because it, the Romantics took place between the French Revolution and the Russian Revolution, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And the war, the fact that they're happening around war was um, because it, those wars were caused by an excess of reason. Like reason can push you toward war if you just follow it um, too far. So if you actually think about the human spirit, then you're less likely to go to war. So um, because the human spirit says live (laughs) Um, and reason can like we're all going to be militant and that is an excess of reason but an excess the other way would be overindulgent yes yes and um so the i'm not going to go into literary (laughs) (laughs) but yes um you know the epochs of literature and art are always pushing back against what happened before it So the 18th century started out correcting a wrong, and then it went too far. And then the 19th century, well, they don't always go in exact centuries, but starts pushing Mm -hmm. against that excess. And then modernity starts pushing against that excess. I mean, the moderns thought that the 19th century, the romantics were just too slipshod and messy, and Ezra Pound calls them wet and sloppy. Um, and so the modern is kind of a return to the 18th century um, strong values of um, preciseness and reason again. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I feel these pulls in your work so much. What? Like, what? <laughs> Sorry, I'm being I mean, I just learned a lot. <laughs> so smart. <laughs> Let's get back to a question about you and Alco being an egghead. I have a, I need you to talk a lot about <laughs> your <laughs> colors. I, I, I want you to be my mentor for your, you, how you use color and how very, very limited the palette oh, is. You. And that you are able to make these, I'm in awe. Oh, thank you. So you want some, you, the, the palette itself? The... Well, not necessarily literally that, but how you came to, did you, I think I saw some images in there where it didn't look like. Right. You, it looked like you were using <coughs> more pure, more saturated color earlier. Before, yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. So, the early ice cream. Yes. Days, so. The sherbet. The sherbet. Right. So. Oh, yeah. So how did you... What, I'm just... I just kept experimenting. I'm with. particularly... This horse one, I just can't believe how few colors there are in that. And I think what? our eyes really like that. It's calming for I there like not it. to be a lot of chroma. A uh, uh, teacher... Um, friend, David LaFell, he always says color against colorlessness. Color against color. And I always thought that, that it's it, It's easier to look at mm-hmm. um, and it is kind of calming. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's closer to what we see too. I do? think we see a lot of neutral. I don't think we see vivid. Maybe I don't. Well, and I'm not really drawn to vivid. Yeah. 
mm-hmm. myself. I had a friend, and I, I was telling him that, and he said, yes, I noticed that, that, you know, I, I like a lot of, I, I always wanted the idea of, a, or wanted to have a, a white garden, just mm-hmm. all the different, Me too. really, <laughs> colors in white. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I think what I would like to do more of in the future is a little more, um, Actually, a lot more dark. Mm. Dark against this same palette. Yeah, so adding some dark. Adding a lot more dark. Yeah. Adding a lot more dark. Mm. But I, I sort of have a formula. I have a formula because I work a lot for the drawings, for the darks, for the skin tones. Mm-hmm. And I just follow that formula. Because mm-hmm. I don't paint a lot from life. Mm-hmm. From, right. From my drawings. Mm-hmm. What is the formula? It's good. good. The formula for darks is black, ivory black, um, Venetian red, burnt sienna, and um, raw sienna. That's the dark. And the light is just um, two kinds of white and raw sienna. And then I bring all the other stuff in the blues and the greens and the, yeah. But that's always what I start with. Hmm. I've seen you have pictures where you're, um, you see the canvas, your ground down, and then you're playing with drawing cutouts for the composition. Yeah. We just What's started that? doing that. that. And that's something I'm actually working with the Missoula Art um, oh. in the studio with. Is, um, and this is something that John suggested a long time ago, the first time I ever did it was to cut out the actual size of the figure and place mm-hmm. it on the canvas and you can figure it out so much better mm-hmm. by just moving it around like paper dolls. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's that's kind of what I'm messing with now. It's really fun. So that's a new development? It's in it's, your... so I'm going to, yeah. Well, you've tried it before. I've tried it before, yeah. but yeah, mm-hmm. it's really, I really like it. And it sort of goes along with that more studied approach to the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this one behind us here, the top one, you mm-hmm. just finished that? I just finished that, and I'm interested in um, the Asian whistler um, mm-hmm. because to me the hardest thing has always been what do you do with the background? You know, what do you do with the background? Shadow. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, yeah, I've been looking at different artists, and, and that's why I think a lot more dark helps because it mm-hmm. kind of holds held you in. Mm-hmm. And this this painting, and actually one I'm working on now, um, I have a screen. I think I should, yeah. Mm. Yeah. What do you do with the background? Because mm-hmm. I love figure, and I always made the mistake of of just because I love the figure so much, it was just all about the figure, and then what do you do, you know? Mm-hmm. The only thing I really like about that is it has a feeling of here is okay, as opposed to in the 18th century where everything had to have Roman colors, and like here isn't okay, like you have to be in some place else or some other era, mm-hmm. or some other setting. And right. That has a feeling of here's okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Right, thank you. It's who we are that's more important than where we are. It's true. Mm-hmm. It's true. Any other questions about or about two and Um, so how did you go about producing the book? And what was your process for it? We heard a little bit about. Well, I've spent most of my professional life being sort of visual storyteller, mm-hmm. uh, either with film or um, graphics or whatever. And so knowing a lot about Linda's work, I just started with a storyboard of images. Some, some were drawings, but mostly with paint. And mm-hmm. just laid them all out and sequenced them how I the story was going to unfold. Uh, and they weren't necessarily chronologically sequenced. Some were thematically 
the sequence, but mm -hmm. but there was a storyboard of her work, and um, we didn't actually even know at that point whether who was going to write the, the book, uh, and it just seemed to start to, to just develop. And it's uh, well, I can I can glue these things together, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, so I started with the visual story, mm -hmm. and uh, then we got to do um, one of my favorite things about you know, really stage of, of working on the book was I knew I had this visual story and I was writing the things that were going to hold it together and uh, we, we did some interviews we we would you know we spent mo we worked together almost every day mm -hmm. but we would go to the coffee shop and have an interview and we uh, had some questions sometimes I was working on a certain section and I have questions about that sometimes it was more historical and I'd say well you know who were who was teaching you when you fell out your best? And, and so we we staged a series of coffee shop interviews to, mm -hmm. to flesh out the story that was going to accompany the visuals. And uh, it, it was just a really fun process. Mm -hmm. What a nice date night that was. Yeah. <laughs> and you end up talking about things that you didn't really talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just to fun. approach it like that. Yeah, right. And, uh, you know, like I said, we, we worked together most of the time for many years and mm -hmm. uh, often in the same room. And yet there are things I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And it was great to do these interviews. Mm -hmm. That was neat. Um, so um, you had a series of really strong mentors that you worked mm -hmm. with. And... Um, how did you kind of manage to keep your yourself through those? I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's one of the things that you that you hear about working with a mentor is that you right. it's it's um, easy to go from mentee to disciple. Right. Um, so, what was your process in keeping yourself? I don't know. I just I I don't think I thought about that a lot. Yeah. I just don't think I could have done it any other way, really. I didn't, it never, it never occurred to me that I wasn't becoming a little whoever I was studying with. Mm -hmm. I just took a little bit from, I guess I just took what I wanted from the various different people. And I, I really did study with some really great people. Yeah. I studied with some really great people. But I, yeah, I always managed to keep my own voice. I don't know. I don't know. I just can't imagine doing it any other way. Mm -hmm. So, I didn't decide not to. I just didn't. I mean, that, that is a, a pool that you hear a lot of. of with yeah. Mentors. Um, that's interesting. Um, what did you like most about working with this book and putting it together? Did you learn anything about your process? And hmm. I learned how long I've been doing it. <laughs> you know, 42 years. Yeah. Yeah. And all the changes, all the experimenting. And, and you know, I've always loved what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I've always been very grateful to be able to do it. And I've been very disciplined about it, about working. What is your discipline? What's your practice? Mm, I try and paint every morning for three or four hours. Yeah. That's, and then, then, then I'm fine. But I mean, even when I used to try to spend a period of my life where I did a lot of traveling, and I would copy the masters. Mm -hmm. So if I had it just like an hour a day, it's just, it's always been my way of kind of keeping myself sane. Mm -hmm. You know, and quiet. And I guess that's where the quiet and the movements come from. Because it does make you quiet. Your mind stops. You know, you stop worrying about all the things you can't do anything about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm so struck by um, this the painting that, that you just finished that's behind you. Um, and... It seems closer than, like, 
mm-hmm. more mm-hmm. often their their scenes. Um, and you know the other word that I hear to describe your paintings is psycho- psychological. There's a, there's a yeah there's I mean because there's clearly something going on these people are, are right, thinking right. so there's a, a psychological overlay to them and that one because you're getting even closer. But this one was was uh, I I often find a a painting I love and try and and this was a what was this. This was a, I think it was a Tarbell pose that I, and I, and I had a wonderful memorial. Mm-hmm. So that's maybe part of, yeah, yeah. And then the end. Yeah. It was a, I think it was a, it was either a Royal Merit Chase or a Tarbell painting that I took that one from. And you're just you, so your interest in it was the pose, the pose, and to have your to stage your model right. in a way. Right. And how often do you work with models? Let's see, I work alone with models probably once every couple of weeks, mm-hmm. and then I go um, currently twice a week to to drawing with the Missouri Fine Arts Studio. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of drawing. I'm drawing. It's fun. Yeah, and this model's terrific. She's yeah. great. What makes a good model? Oh, we're compatible. So she's not irritating. She's much. not irritating. <laughs> she's uh, she's very pretty, and uh, uh, she reminds me of like a Toulouse Lautrec. Um, yeah. yeah. She's beautiful red hair, and yeah. And she likes to work with me too, so it's it's a good deal. Huh. Yeah, and she's quiet. You know? Is that laugh. word again? Quiet. Quiet. <laughs> Quiet. So we can laugh. You know, she's, and I won't have her for very long because she'll move on, but she's she's really, really great. Hmm. When you're working with models, do you try to get an exact likeness or? No. Or you, what, no. What, what, what's your, what's it's the feeling. It's the feeling. Not, not necessarily about portraiture. Because if you met Halsey, I mean, you might not even know that, that was Halsey, but. Yeah, but I'm still it's copying It's the feeling yeah, yeah, yeah. of the pose. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I invite you to take a, a deeper look at this book and um, come over and talk to me about the paintings because I'm up for interpretation pretty much 24-7, <laughs> as you can tell. Um, and I, I think it's a really beautiful book, and it's a, it's a fascinating exploration of um, a, a life in the arts, you know, which is something that is laudable. Yeah, thank you. In itself, that you that you have done this for forty years, um, like what a beautiful record. <clears throat> and one of the projects that I love of Linda's is that she took old paintings that maybe she didn't like anymore, or something, and took out the parts that she likes and made a box of these like mini paintings um, that are part of old canvases that she's giving to her children. Um, mm-hmm. So they have this sort of, like you would give a yearbook, <laughs> they have this this of her, of her life of painting right. from from the early days on. Yeah, I think that's really, I love those boxes. <laughs> <laughs> and she also right. brought a really lovely box of, um, of drawings and prints that you can look at on the back table when you go pick up your book. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, let's give them a hand, shall we?